I'm Chip Mason. I'm in product management in our mainframe security division. I don't know if you've seen some of our earlier presentations. Um, I know you have. Uh, I don't know if you gentlemen have seen it. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about today about some basics in terms of regulations and standards. Um, we'll review a few of them. And then we'll talk about some of our solutions in the mainframe security area that, uh, that are meant to help you um, answer some of these regulations and standards. So let's first talk about the prize. Um, why do we have to worry about, and why are there more and more regulations? Why are there standards as to how we need to manage our data and manage our mainframe? And the real reason real is that there is a prize that, uh, that, that many are after. The prize is the data on our mainframe. That's the whole reason anybody is hacking our environments. Now, not just to get in the mainframe, but to get it distributed and everywhere else that we have that data. But the mainframe, again, is, is a target. And, and folks think the mainframe has never been hacked, and, and that's really untrue. Um, and in an area where the mainframe is, is quite vulnerable that we don't talk about too much is the area of social engineering. And that's true for just about any um, area within the data center, the mainframe in particular. Now, the mainframe is protected primarily by a user ID password combination. We're getting more experience and fancier in doing two-factor authentication and lots of other things. But by and large, it's a password and a user ID. There's a study by a security group called Mandiant, uh, where they had done their annual survey. And they found out this somewhat frightening fact. And that is that when hackers get on your network, they stay on your network for 147 days on average. So oftentimes we think about hackers, it's a script kitty getting in and out, just for the fun of it just for the laws of getting into uh, uh, and saying that they hacked the IRS or they hacked the CIA or whatever it might be. And that may be what it used to be, but not anymore. These days it's organized crime and lots of other things that are doing this because they can sell our data on the black market and they sell it and make money, lots of money. Mandy found that on average, Hackers were in our network for 147 days. Now just think about that. If you could be on someone's network for 147 days, what could you do, right? You're, you're sniffing around, you're trying to find ways around, but my guess is that you could probably get an ID and a password to a mainframe without a whole lot of trouble, right? Especially if you knew what you were doing. So this is something that's really frightening to me is that social engineering, which is just the matter of pretending that you're sending an email from the CEO asking for a basic reset of my password or something like that. But that's not the only thing because we have people on our networks. The other thing is about the data. Now oftentimes we think about data on the mainframe as being safe, it's on the mainframe. But here's the deal. We're building applications today, particularly mobile applications, that are accessing mainframe data. We're taking data on the mainframe and we're moving it off the mainframe to distributed platforms. We're doing what? Analytics? Anybody doing analytics and, and moving data all over the place? What is that data? You know, is that data something that should be protected and stay on the mainframe? Do we even know? So the mainframe data is not staying safe on the mainframe. It's fluid. It's moving around the network. And then finally, one of the issues that all this compounds it is that the security teams that are often in charge of managing our data center often don't have a lot of skills in terms of mainframe. To them, mainframe is a black box. It's safe. It has all these myths. And they're not really sure what is on it. They don't know what data is there and what the importance of that data is. They certainly probably know that many of the applications that run their business run there and reside there, but they're not really sure what level of risk that might entail. Now, why should we care about that? And, and the reason is, is a number of things. Number one is, there's lots of new regulations that are coming to bear. Now, we've seen regulations coming from the European uh, theater. We've seen regulations within the US. Uh, we've seen a lot of it. And oftentimes, it's a global impact regulation. Just because a regulation is a US, say, federal regulation, oftentimes, that impacts us across the globe. We've seen what we'll talk about in a minute, GDPR, impacting US companies as well. So this is something that's really, we're seeing more and more regulations, and it won't stop. Some other studies show that 14% of breaches are due to negligence and error. Just sending data to the wrong IP address or the wrong web page or the wrong email address. 14% of that. 10%, frightening enough, 
is, ca is caused by insider threat. This is people who we've granted permissions to that are actually accessing data they may not, should, maybe shouldn't use or shouldn't access and then sending that data off the mainframe for nefarious purposes. This threat is growing so much that now Gartner is tracking this as an item that they're keeping and they're gonna begin reporting on. They call it second streamers. They've even named what these insiders are. They're called second streamers. And that's because they're getting a second income stream just from taking data and selling it. Okay, 10%. 338 US thefts of social security numbers, 164 million records were stolen last year, right? That's a lot of social security numbers, right? Now, when I was in college, and I won't tell you how long ago that was, but when I was in college, when we had a test, and we wanted to know what the score was, we'd have to walk over to the professor's office, and he would post on a piece of paper on his door, your score. And it was your social security number next to your grade. And your social security number is how you figured out what your grade is. Everybody, all 200 people in your class, all those social security numbers on the door. We didn't think any of it, right? The social security number, everybody had one. What was the big deal? Of course, now we'd be absolutely terrified if anybody saw our social security number because of the things they could do with it. So what's happened now? What's changed is that now we understand that some of this personally identifiable information can be misused to do identity theft, to do all kinds of things. And now what wasn't um, personal information before suddenly is. And you think about the mainframe, that's really important because in the mainframe the data is, I won't call it static, but it has a certain persistence that other platforms don't really have. And that's because we don't really know what the data is. It was probably created by somebody who's retired or an application that we retired a while ago. There's a whole lot of data there in file formats that we're not even sure what they're from. There's batch jobs that creates files, all kinds of things. And rather than deleting them or getting rid of them, we leave them in place because we're not really sure what the impact would be of deleting them. And they may not have been sensitive then. You know, list of social security numbers, big deal, 30 years ago, right? Today, it's a very big deal. But we don't know what those data are. Many of those things are lost or orphaned or just forgotten. And this is a risk, particularly as we have regulations coming up. So let's talk a little bit about the regulations and what they might mean and, and why we should care about this. So the four of them I'm going to cover. Um, these are regulations, some of them are laws, some of them are best practices, and some of them are something in between. We're going to talk about GDPR, which is the European regulation, PCI DSS, which is our payment card industry, um, one called OMB Circular A130, and this is an executive order, and then HIPAA. So let's talk a little bit about these. This first one is called General Protection Data Regulation. It replaces an earlier version of this regulation called the EU Data Privacy Directive. It will actually go into full effect in May 2018. It's actually already in effect, but they're really going to start um, going after people with this uh, in May 2018. It applies to anyone or any company that collects data of EU citizens, regardless of where you're located. So if you're located like my friends here in Pennsylvania and they have data on EU citizens, it still applies to you. There are stricter security plans or requirements. Now, one of the things that this uh, particular regulation is famous for is that if you let EU data about EU citizens get stolen, the penalties can be really, really severe. Um, something on the order of, I think, 4% of your uh, company's revenue Okay, so it can be an enormous amount of money <coughs> that you will be fined if you allow EU data on EU citizens to leave your server, your control. So EU citizen data cannot leave the EU. An EU citizen can request that you remove their data. And they can also ask you how you're using that data. <coughs> so this is very important that you make sure you know where EU data is and that you're in control of it. There's another um, twist to this, or part of this, and it's called Privacy Shield. So this is an agreement between the US government and the EU that allows US companies to hold EU citizen data outside of the European Union. That way, banks in New York or, or insurance companies in Pennsylvania don't have to put a data center in Germany, say, just to hold EU data. You can actually hold it in the US. 
But by doing so, you agree to apply and, and be guided by the GDPR regulations. And by the way, you're also subject to their fines. So this allows you to keep your data center assets where you happen to have them, but you still must abide by these regulations. So you need to know what EU system data you have, where it is, and you gotta make sure it does not leave your control. Anybody familiar with this one? This was new. You're familiar with this one? Is a new one for you? Okay. New one. All right. Okay. GDPR. This is a big one, and this is gonna. You're gonna hear a lot more about this in the next next few uh, months. Uh, most everyone's familiar with PCI, which is Payment Card Industry. Um, uh, the technical regulations around data are what's called the uh, Data Security Standard. Um, PCI was established in 2006 by all the big credit card companies. Um, it's not really a regulation, it's a standard, although the payment card industry will hold you to these standards in order to approve you to do credit card clearing and other things like that. There are a whole bunch of requirements here. Some of them I called out is that, that you must protect stored, called stored cardholder data. You have to have secure systems, you have to secure applications and processes. You have to restrict access to cardholder data on a business need to know. So those of you using some of our ESMs know what this means. You gotta assign a unique, unique ID to each person with computer access. That's kind of standard in the world. The mainframe and track and monitor all access to network resources. So these are standard best practices in this case. However, you must actually report on those and make sure you do other things. Other things including, for example, you must never store magnetic stripe data from a payment card. If you do, that's a severe violation. You don't want to do that. So those are the kind of things you need to discover and make sure you understand where your PCI data may exist. And again, this one, as well as the GDPR, are really important because they require you to report on who in your organization has access to the data and who has actually accessed that data. That's an important report and requirement of many of these. The OMB Circular A130, typical government, it's a long and complicated name. This is basically something that comes from the Office of Management and Budget, effectively the, the executive branch of our government, and it basically tells the IT departments within our federal government how they must maintain security standards of their data. Um, they must maintain only the amount of individual taxpayer information required to meet their mission. They must ensure that all sensitive data is appropriately protected by standards established by NIST, which NIST has a whole bunch of other standards if you're familiar with those as well. There's also regulations covering such things as the DISA STIGs, so that also comes into play here as well. This contains all the key regulations. When you hear about security in the federal government and best practices, it is contained within this paper, which is literally a document that the executive branch and the president signs. It's an executive order that contains such things as the Privacy Act, Computer Security Act, and everything else. HIPAA is aligned to this. You'll see HIPAA referred to in this, but HIPAA actually is a law that was passed. This is not a law. And then finally, HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act of 1999. It was initially passed for those that hold health care information, health care plans, clearing houses, a health care provider. But now it also applies to business associates. So pretty much anyone that maintains health information about their employees, including their health plans or anything else on their server, this will apply to you, okay? Anybody in here a healthcare organization? Okay, so you know about HIPAA. <laughs> okay, very good. Nice. Four rules, privacy, security, enforcement, and breach notification rule. In the case here, they all really apply. The security rule is the, the most important for our purposes, so we have to ensure confidentiality of this PHI information. Um, you have to prove who has the ability to access it. You have to identify, and these are kind of standard, you have to identify against anticipated threats, protect against anticipated uses or disclosures. So essentially it's not really a best practice on how to behave, it's just a regulation that says you better protect this data or else. Um, so again, the most important one here is to make sure that you have and you know which users have access to the data and you can prove which users have access or access that data. Okay, regulations, everybody clear on those? These are just four of them. Oh, there's plenty more, but these are the ones we're gonna talk about here. So let's talk about that. So everyone in here who, has anyone heard about 
um, our data content discovery tool. Everyone here, so everybody's heard about you? Okay. I'm gonna recover it again, so, um, but we're gonna talk a little bit because it's really important in some of these regulations. Obviously, 70% of the data we talk a lot about uh, is on the mainframe, we call Mission Essential. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a real big issue in the mainframe in that the data is relatively static. It's been around for a while, there's lost, there's orphan, there's hidden data that we're not sure about. Somebody goes and copies a file and renames it or creates it under a different name that's non-standard within your naming conventions and all of a sudden it's lost because we can't find it. We don't know what it's called anymore. Um, and we're also taking the mainframe off, taking data off the mainframe is also a complication that we can solve with DTD. So what are our solutions? So again, identifying the key data to make the decision on how it's stored, how it's transmitted, how, how it's secured is really important. Classifying that data so we can discover what of that data is actually sensitive. Where are your social security numbers? You know, where is your PHI information? Alerting and preventing when sensitive data is accessed, so no matter who accesses it, or when it leaves the mainframe. Those are also important aspects. We can also help you refine access rules by establishing a relationship with a job description, providing audit information for auditors around classification and access types. So DCD is a, a critical part of this because this is the way we can actually do the identification and classification. We do this by finding the regulated data, classifying it, and then helping you protect that data. As we've said before, we have a broad set of file types that DCD can uh, <coughs> access. This is really important because not all our data is contained in DB2 databases. Uh, much of our data, in fact, much of the old data is even in vSAM files or QSAM or PDS files. Um, and these are really important to be able to scan as well so you can find that lost or hidden data that may be 30, 40 years old. Um, but we can also scan the HFS and ZFS. We can do the DB2 tables. We're adding Datacom, um, IMS, and we also now can do data in motion around FTP and a few other methodologies. And this list keeps growing. We've gotten some requests here in the rooms the last few days about handling database and IND dollar file and a few others. It goes on forever. <laughs> we'll continue to do that. So talking about the regulations, of course, we have a whole set of classifiers uh, in the tool around the PCI regulations. Um, so we can help you find all the information that PCI regulates including the magnetic stripe data, the primary account number, the name, and all those sorts of things. So this is a critical area if you're doing and you're beholden to PCI standards, this product will help you and can report out on how you're doing in terms of, uh, for example, finding magnetic stripe data in a data file that may be 20 years old. Finally, we also do HIPAA data, um, and so we have a number of other things, including health plan uh, information, beneficiary numbers, um, and we're also working on a few other things such as doing photographs, um, doing uh, digital x-rays, uh, so identifying those is another critical aspect of what we're doing here. Uh, but we have a number of PHI attributes if you're found under the HIPAA regulations. And then finally, if you're under GDPR, we have a bunch of generic, uh, what we call PII classifications that have all kinds of things, name, address, um, and critically for GDPR, national identification number and driver's license. So we have a number of national identification numbers, including passports and other kinds of uh, IDs for places like Italy and Germany and UK and France and everywhere else. So um, in order to do that, you can actually scan your databases for EU citizen identification numbers. We also have it for driver's license numbers uh, for a number of those countries as well. So that's a good first start in terms of seeing what you might be, uh, whether you might be at risk or covered under the, the uh, GDPR regulations, okay? So as you can see, this is a screenshot. I won't go into the demo unless uh, anyone wants to see it. But in the screenshots, you can see that we have a number of classifiers and they're grouped um, in, in these groups. So payment card industry uh, classifiers are available. You just click it and choose them and then direct the product to go off and scan and look at those actually. Once you uh, actually complete a scan, you get a report that looks something like this. Um, obviously, we don't show you the data because uh, most likely the person actually running the scan is not allowed to see the regulated data. So we don't want to show that. But we'll show you a list of the data set name, sort of how many rows have been scanned. We can show you how many are hit. And we can actually show you which classifier, in this case, is payment card. 
account number, uh, and you can actually see who did the scan and when it was, and all the basic information about uh, the scan itself. But once you actually do the scan, then you can actually do a, a quick link and see of all the users that you have on your mainframe, which users have permission to access that classified or sensitive piece of data. This is a good first step for things like HIPAA and things like GDPR where you have to report out who has access to a particular sensitive data set. You'll have to report that information out. And then finally, the last bit of that is you also have to show, oops, do I not have it? Uh, yes, I do. You have to show who has accessed that data. Now, in order to do that, you have to actually monitor, particularly in real time, what your user activity is around a particular data set. And that's where another product within our portfolio comes into play called Compliance Event Manager. And Compliance Event Manager is our enterprise security uh, monitoring platform. It's tied into the ZOS and things like RACF, ACF2, and Top Secret. And it's monitoring all the changes and all the access um, uh, activity on the mainframe itself. There's also a number of other things that we can do in terms of including monitoring PDS changes and whatnot that, that could lead to what we call hacker or bad activity on the, on the case of a syscall. Nevertheless, the biggest thing that we do here is really understanding which users are accessing which data sets. And here you get a report that shows you exactly for that particular data set which users are accessing that. So in this case, you can see that uh, Albert Einstein actually accessed this database in May of 2015, and you can see he's, he's accessed it 12 times. And that might be important. Um, it may be really important that one of these people have accessed it 43 times. Um, that may be seen as excessive, depending on what the role is. In fact, you may see that there's a user that has accessed a data set that probably shouldn't be accessing that data set. Even though he has permission, he's actually accessed it. So this could help you lead to uh, discovering maybe users that shouldn't be accessing or some sort of nefarious activity. Let's hope not. So how does CA mainframe security help? Obviously, we talked about CA data disco content discovery. Again, finding that data is a really critical aspect of doing this. So is anybody in the room, are you doing even manual discovery and classification? Data dictionaries? Yeah, what, what kind of, what are you doing? Okay. How are you finding? It's all manual, home ground. Using tools or just opening up the files and scanning them? Okay. All right. So I, I hear that quite often as well. Also here, uh, folks will often use what are called data dictionaries, uh, which are when you actually have your developers who are building the applications actually uh, encode literally in like a Word file or an Excel spreadsheet which rows and which columns are designed to have sensitive data in them. So at least you get a start of knowing where you might potentially have sensitive data. Um, so I've heard of those two things in manual as well. So this, this is actually a really um, good solution to actually get a start, and a head start, on where you might have the bulk of your data. Um, obviously, there's going to be some, some custom things that you might have in your organization. Um, account numbers may be different, et cetera, that you'll need to add to the product. And then finally, com CA Compliance Event Manager, which again is our security incident notification system. Many of the regulations, including PCI, require you to have what is called a security incident notification system. And you need to have one of those not only in the enterprise, but also on the mainframe. So if you're not getting security incidents from your mainframe into your enterprise SOC, then you're missing a number of regulatory requirements, particularly for, D uh, for PCI DSS. Okay, so does everyone have a security incident system on your mainframe? Okay. Or something? Maybe you're it? <laughs> <laughs> no, basically we use the audit, uh, the, our audit file. So you're just doing SMF dumps? And, yeah. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Um, and then finally we have another product here that, that's really helpful called CA Cleanup. Anybody here use CA Cleanup? Okay, so I don't need to talk about cleanup, but everybody knows cleanup, so. It rocks. Uh, hmm? It rocks. It rocks. Yeah, I was just talking to a customer today um, who uh, recently joined a company, um, and he's administrating ACF2, and he said the biggest problem he has is that he has 30 years worth of rules and users in there, and he, they can't make sense of it all, and so uh, that's what we talked about, cleanup. So you know what it does. Um, so it really helps there. So that's a good first start for that particular customer. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, since, um, would anybody want to see DCD? I know you've already seen it. 
or CEM. Is anybody interested in seeing a demonstration? I didn't think so. You've already seen it, Craig. Um, so there you go. I thought I would end a little bit early. That way we can uh, be done. And uh, I appreciate your paying attention. And I know you've seen it all before, so thank you again. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Listen.